Uh, we are speaking about the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit as listed in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 8, 9 and 10. And this has led us to examine the basic Greek word that is used, which has become so familiar to us in the form charismatic. The Greek word is charisma. And in our first study, we went through the various places in the New Testament where this is, word is used, and we sought to get a general picture of the meaning of the word and its associations. We pointed out that it's directly associated with the Greek word charis, which means grace, and that charisma means grace made definite or specific or some particular operation or manifestation or form of God's grace in the life of a believer. That is, one who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace is offered only through Jesus Christ. He is the only channel of divine grace. Now, in this passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we have nine specific gifts listed, and I think once again I will just go through the list without reading the intervening words, beginning in verse 8, the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, faith, the gifts of healing, the working of miracles, prophecy, discerning of spirits, diverse kinds of tongues, the interpretation of tongues. There are nine. Now, we found in our previous study 25 distinct instances of the word charisma. So, naturally, we ask ourselves this question, what is there special about these nine gifts mentioned here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12? Why are they in a special category on their own? And I would suggest the answer in terms of simple scientific phraseology that we should think about charisma as a genus, and these nine gifts, which are usually called the gifts of the Holy Spirit, as one species in that genus. This naturally leads to the second question, what is it that causes these gifts in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 to differ from the other examples of charisma? What is the distinguishing feature of these gifts of the Holy Spirit that are listed here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12? Now, I think many, many Christians talk about spiritual gifts and gifts of the Holy Spirit, but they don't have a real understanding as to what particularly distinguishes these gifts. And I would suggest that the answer is found in verse 7, the verse that introduces the list, where Paul says, the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all, or for a useful, profitable, practical purpose. And I believe that the key word that distinguishes these nine from all the others is the word manifestation. Manifestation, as I understand it, means an open revelation to the senses. Something that is manifest is something that can be perceived by the senses, by the eye, by the ear, and so on. So what distinguishes these from the others is that they are manifestations of the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit himself comes to indwell the believer in Jesus Christ, and he's there, as I understand the teaching of the New Testament, as a person. The body of the believer becomes the temple in which the person of the Holy Spirit dwells. The Apostle Paul says in this same first epistle to the Corinthians, Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit which is in you. So that, as I understand Scripture, every believer who has received the baptism in the Holy Spirit has the person of the Holy Spirit indwelling the physical temple of his body. But the Holy Spirit within that temple is invisible. He is imperceptible. He, his presence cannot be uh, perceived by any of the five senses. Now, these gifts, are the ways in which the invisible Holy Spirit is made manifest out of that believer. When we see these manifestations, they are the evidence of the invisible Spirit dwelling in that believer. And there are nine distinctive manifestations which are given forth from the believer in whom the Holy Spirit dwells. So that the key distinguishing word is the word manifestation. Every one of these 
in some way or another, must be perceptible by the senses. The Holy Spirit himself being invisible, but the results that he produces in these gifts in the life of the believer are perceptible by the senses. I think there's an example of this given in the teaching of Jesus which he gave to Nicodemus in the third chapter of John's Gospel where he spoke about the Holy Spirit in terms of the wind and he said, The wind bloweth where it listeth and thou hearest the sound thereof but canst not tell whence it cometh or whither it goeth. The Holy Spirit is here typified by the wind. Now none of us has ever seen the wind but we know when the wind is blowing because we see the things that the wind does. The, the leaves come off the trees, the trees all bend in one particular direction, the clouds go scudding across the sky, the dust is thrown up in the streets and so on. And when we see all these things happening, they are the manifestations of the wind. We never see the wind. Nobody has ever yet and cannot see the wind. Its nature is to be invisible. But the things the wind does are manifestations of the wind. And no one sees the Holy Spirit indwelling another believer but the things the Holy Spirit does from within that believer are the manifestations of his presence, the distinctive revelations that he's there and operating in certain specific ways. It is important to understand that it is scriptural to speak about manifestations of the Holy Spirit. As some Christians have got such a picture of the Holy Spirit, he's so sacred and so invisible and so spiritual that it's never anything that you can ever get close to or feel or experience. Now this isn't correct. There are many, many things the Holy Spirit does which are perceptible. I'd like to just illustrate this from two passages in the New Testament. The first one is in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, of course, describes the events on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit descended in person from heaven to take up his dwelling within the newly formed church of Jesus Christ on earth. And uh, no one can question that there were manifestations. And it was the manifestations of the Holy Spirit that drew the great crowd of people to hear the sermon that Peter preached which brought 3,000 souls to the point of decision. If there had never been any manifestations, no one would ever have known that the Holy Spirit had come. He's known through his manifestations. And there's one very interesting little word that's used several times which is important to notice. Let me give you the verse that I have in mind and then I'll trace it back for a moment. In Acts 2, verses 32 and 33, Peter is coming to the climax of his message and he's preached about Jesus and the course of his ministry, his death and his resurrection, and finally his ascension into heaven. And this is how he closes. Verse 32, This Jesus hath God raised up from the dead, whereof we all are witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he hath shed forth or poured out this, which ye now see and hear. Notice. They didn't see and hear the Holy Spirit, but they saw and heard what the Holy Spirit did in and through the believers whom he had come to indwell. And it's rather interesting to notice this word, this, which is a, one of the chains that run through this description. I'd like you to look back in that chapter uh, to verse 7 or even verse 6. I'm assuming that you're basically familiar with the events that initiated this whole incident. Uh, the descent of the Holy Spirit, him appearing in cloven tongues of fire, sitting on the head of each one, each one being filled with the Holy Spirit, and beginning to speak in other languages, new languages, which they have not learned. Now in verse 6 it says, Now when this was noised abroad, or... In some of the modern versions, when this noise was, came abroad, it was the noise that attracted the crowd. Let's remember that. Noise is a manifestation. It's a thing that can be heard. When this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. It's perfectly specific as to what astonished the multitude. It was that they heard these Galilean fishermen talking languages which the other people recognized and they knew the Galileans didn't know. 
This is the point at issue. And in verse 7, they made it even more clear. They were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans, and how hear we every man in our own tongue or language wherein we were born? Then going on to verse 12, and notice what they were referring to, these Galilean fishermen speaking in languages which they didn't know. They said, verse 12, they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? What's this? These people speaking in languages that they didn't know. It's quite specific. It couldn't refer to anything else. Now, Peter stood up and he put them right because some people said, well, these men are drunken. What are you listening to them for? Peter said, verse 15, these are not drunken as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. No one gets drunk at nine o'clock in the morning. That's the effect of what he said. But verse 16, notice, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. This, again, refers to the same thing, the speaking in the other languages. Now, what does Peter say about this, the speaking in other languages? This is that. What's that? The promised outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which was given through the prophet Joel. Here is something that is specifically joined together with the little linking word is. This is that. What's this? All these people speaking in other languages. What's that? the outpouring of the Holy Spirit spoken of on the day of Pentecost. There is no question about it. It cannot have any other meaning. They said, what mean is this? Peter said, this is that. And then at the end of his message, in the verse that we read, verse 33, he came back to this. And I'll read that 33rd verse again. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he hath shed forth, more literally, poured out this, which ye now see and hear. What's this? The same this as all the way through. What did they see and hear? They saw and heard these men speaking other languages, which they knew these men had never learned by natural understanding or education. So here is a very clear proof that when the Holy Spirit comes to indwell the believer, He's going to produce manifestations out of that believer which can be seen and heard. This is actually the evidence of his having come. It's a manifestation. It's something that is perceptible by the senses. Then notice what Paul says about his own preaching and ministry in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. I think I could read even from verse 1 because I particularly love these words. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. He was not a great preacher. Many people imagine Paul was a terrific preacher, but this is contradicted by Scripture because in, later in this or in the second epistle to the Corinthians, he quoted his enemies as saying that his bodily presence was weak and his speech contemptible. He was no preacher. I think Peter was a tremendous preacher, but Paul was not a pulpit personality at all. He was uh, apparently a rather small and, uh, they say, bandy-legged little man. I don't know quite where they got that from. And he wasn't a tremendous orator. So how did he produce his results? This is the secret. He said, it was not with excellency of speech or of wisdom. It wasn't my degree that I got at the feet of Gamaliel. How did I do it? Well, let's look. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, Paul was a very learned man. And he made a rather remarkable decision to forget all that he knew. And to know only one thing, which was Jesus Christ. And not merely Jesus Christ, but Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. You read the 18th chapter of Acts. He was in danger of his life. He was about to get up and leave and the Lord spoke to him in a vision and said, don't go, speak, don't be afraid. I have much people in this city. And then verse 4, my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Now I want you to notice that word demonstration. It exactly lines up with manifestation. What was the secret of Paul's ministry? Not oratory, not education, but the manifestation of the supernatural power of God. The demonstration, the visible manifestation of the Holy Spirit. How can you demonstrate the Holy Spirit? He's invisible. 
you demonstrate him through the supernatural gifts which Paul enumerates in the 12th chapter of the same epistle. And he says that there's a purpose for this and I want you to notice it. Verse 5, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men but in the power of God. The faith of every true Christian should not be based on intellectual, philosophical arguments, on seminary trained professors and degrees, but on personal experience of God's power. I remember when I was a missionary in East Africa, I came to a kind of crisis in ministering to the African students whom I was teaching and training to be teachers, because they said yes to everything but you never knew how much they really believed. The problem was too much acquiescence. So one day I remember standing in front of the students in a, um, an assembly and I said, I want to thank you that you're so cooperative and obedient and willing to do what we ask. And I said, whatever we ask you to do, you do. And I said, I know the reason why, because your education depends on us and you want education. It's your God. But I said, in the minds of most of you, there still remains a great big question mark. And when I said that, they began to look at me. And I said, the question that's in your minds is this. Is the Bible a book for Africans that you can read and trust? Or is it just a white man's book which somebody's brought from another country which doesn't really relate to Africa? And I said, many of your own African elders are telling you that it's just a white man's book that you better not spend your time trying to obey or to follow. Well, when I said that, there was quite a silence because I had said the very thing that they were thinking. So when I brought out this question that was in their minds, I said, now I want to tell you one more thing. I cannot answer that question for you. Well, that surprised them because they thought missionaries could answer all questions. I said, there's only one way you'll find the answer to that question, and that is if you have a personal experience of the supernatural power of God in your life. When you have that experience, you'll know it didn't come from Britain, it didn't come from America, it came from God. And I said, when you have that, then you'll know. And I, I dismissed the assembly, I didn't argue with them. I went away and prayed. And I prayed on this basis. I said, Lord, you said, whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And I have been sowing the word of God to these young people, and you said, if we sow to the Spirit, we shall of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Now I'm holding you to your word. And I preached the word and I prayed and I did not do anything to coerce them into any type of acquiescence to the Christian faith. About six months later, there was a sovereign intervention of God in that college. So, a matter of fact, I'll tell you briefly how it happened. It was quite remarkable. We had what was called a half-term break and most of the students went off home for a long weekend. But there were about six or eight students whose homes were so far away they couldn't get there and come back in time. So they stayed in the college. And my wife and I thought we ought to do something for these six or eight lonely young men. So we invited them up to our home, which was a little unconventional in that set setting in Africa, to have a cup of tea. Being at that time more British than American, tea was what we offered them. So they came up and they were very little accustomed to a, a kind of what should I say, a European or American style of living and sitting in chairs and sitting around and talking and making conversation. They had no experience of that. And so we sat there rather stiffly and we served them tea and they took about five spoonfuls of sugar each one in each cup. <laughs> and then I thought, well, what are we going to do with them now? And I said, maybe we should have a word of prayer. Well, docilely and obediently, they would kneel down to pray. And we started to pray and something happened. It was like a thunderclap. And something came into that room and it just hit us. And every one of those students started praying out loud simultaneously. Now they were praying in a language I didn't know, but I don't think it was praying in other tongues. I think it was their own tribal language. Now we were in a Pentecostal mission, but the other missionaries complained later we made too much noise. But it was a divine act. I didn't have anything to do with it. I couldn't have done it if I'd stood on my hand. God intervened. And that started something which went on for approximately four years. We had a sovereign, supernatural move of the Holy Spirit in that college. About three months later, I was speaking to the same group of students again. I read to them Acts chapter 2, verse 17. I think I'll read that for you for a moment. Acts chapter 2, 17. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my Spirit upon all flesh. 
Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams. I read it carefully and slowly and made sure they understood the meaning. Now I said, I call you all to record that every single statement that's made in that verse has happened to you. It hasn't happened to somebody in another country or another college or another church. It's happened to you. You've experienced it. Your eyes have seen it. Your ears have heard it. This is God's testimony to you that you're living in the last days. No, I'm not asking you to believe something that a white man said or something that is in a white man's book. You have first-hand experiential evidence that this is true. And I'll tell you that did for them what no series of sermons or arguments or theological evidences or seminary training could ever have done. It changed their entire attitude, their way of behavior. It made that college a place that was worth living in. It wasn't an effort to get them to pray. We had to stop them praying. They wouldn't go to bed. They would pray all night in their dormitories. This was a sovereign intervention of God. But it came through the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. When they really found that this was for real in their own experiences, then you didn't have to keep priming them and prodding them and pushing them along. This is what the Apostle Paul says. It is not enough to have sound doctrine, theology, education, argument, reasoning. It will not do the job. Our faith must not be based in the wisdom of men but in the power of God. That's the only faith. And I show you in these last days with the power of wickedness mounting on every hand and every type of assault against the faith of God and Jesus Christ and the true church of God, no one is going to get through that doesn't have a personal experience of supernatural power in their own lives. This is not a luxury. It's a necessity. And the Apostle Paul treated it that way. Let's look back at those words of his again for a moment. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we'll just read verses 4 and 5 again because they're the key to seeing the importance of what we're studying. 1 Corinthians 2, 4 and 5 My speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power that your faith should not stand or be based in the wisdom of men but in the power of God. So we have established this, that it is scriptural to talk about the manifestation or the demonstration of the Holy Spirit. And these particular nine gifts in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 are distinguished from other gifts that God gives by being supernatural manifestations of the Holy Spirit out of the life of a believer. Now, for a moment, let us consider the relationship between the ministry gifts which are spoken of in Ephesians 4.11 and the gifts of the Holy Spirit, which are spoken of in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We have already read the list of the gifts in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Let's look at the list of ministry gifts in Ephesians chapter 4, just once more, for a brief moment. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11, and it is speaking about the resurrected Christ. For it says in verse 8, When he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive, and gave gifts unto men. That's Ephesians 4, 8. And then in verse 11, it specifies five main gifts that he gave to men. He gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors, and teachers. Now, I want to take a moment or two to bring out certain points of difference between what I call the ministry gifts and what I call the spiritual gifts, or the gifts of the Holy Spirit. It's important to see this. And if you look at your outline, you'll see that we have two parallel columns. On the left-hand side, we have ministry gifts. On the right-hand side, we have spiritual gifts. And we notice three points in which they're distinguished. First of all, taking the ministry gift, the believer himself is the gift given by Christ to his church. This is important to see. Look at Ephesians 4.11, you'll see this is the wording. He gave some apostles. He didn't give to some apostleship. He gave some apostles. The men were the gift given by whom? By Christ. To whom? The church. These are Jesus' gifts to his church because the church cannot ever be what Jesus intends without these ministry gifts. So that in the ministry, the man in his capacity as a minister or the lady, if it applies, is the gift. The Apostle Paul was Jesus' gift to the Gentile church. 
was his gift. Likewise, a prophet is a gift by Jesus to his church. On the other hand, with spiritual gifts, the gift is given to the person. To one is given the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge. The person has the gift. Putting it in very simple language, the ministry gift, the person is the gift. The spiritual gift, the person has the gift. Then the second point of distinction, point number two, with the ministry gifts, every aspect of the total ministry makes up the gift. A ministry, in a certain sense, is a lifetime. It's like a man who is an athlete, let's say he runs the mile faster than anybody else. His whole life centers around running the mile. And the man who is an apostle, his whole life centers around being an apostle or a prophet or an evangelist. In fact, Paul in many places compares Christian ministries to the activities of athletes because there's so much that's parallel. The need for training, the need for discipline, the need for dedication, all these things are parallel. So that a ministry is not just a brief revelation of something, a brief manifestation that may only last a few seconds or minutes. A ministry is a, is a life work. On the other hand, these nine supernatural gifts are just brief, dramatic, brilliant, arresting manifestations that happen and are finished. For instance, a prophetic utterance is given, it may last, what, 30 seconds, a minute, two minutes, it's finished. It isn't something that goes on all the time. A word of wisdom is given, it occurs in a few seconds. A man suddenly gets a revelation that directs him to do something that he could not do by natural understanding. Discerning of spirits is given, a person suddenly sees there's the spirit of lust in that man or some other spirit. We'll come to the detailed outworking of these things a little later. But again, the ministry is almost a lifetime. The spiritual gift, it's just a momentary thing. It's almost like a flash of lightning or a thunderclap. It's just there and finished. And because of this, it's important to see the third distinction. In the ministry, character is involved. But in a spiritual gift, character is not involved. Now, this is so important to understand. This. You see, the gifts of the Holy Spirit are like the kind of gifts that we see on a Christmas tree. It doesn't take long to put a gift on a Christmas tree, does it? And it doesn't take long to get it off. It's a momentary act putting it on. It's a momentary act taking it off. And because I received an electric shoe polisher for Christmas, as I did, doesn't make me any different person to what I was before I received the shoe polisher. If I was lazy and disorderly before I received the shoe polisher, I'll still be lazy and disorderly afterwards. It may make it a little easier for me to be lazy with the shoe polisher, but it doesn't change my character. As a ministry cannot be divorced from a character. See, this is the difference. So you've got to be very, very much uh, you've got to be discerning about spiritual gifts. A person may receive a marvellous spiritual gift and have a lousy character. This is a fact. And the gift doesn't change the character. Nor has that person got anything to boast about because he's received a gift. Paul said, why do you boast about it? If it's a gift, you've got nothing that makes you any different from anybody else except the gift. And that didn't come from you. It's so important to see this. Now, here's a very clear example that I've picked out. Uh, Ephesians 4.11, it says, in the middle of that verse, he gave some prophets. That is, Jesus Christ gave to his church some men, or maybe women, with the ministry of a prophet or a prophetess. 1 Corinthians 14.31 1 Corinthians 14.31 For ye may all prophesy one by one. Now notice, prophesying doesn't give you the ministry of a prophet. A prophet is a ministry. Prophesying is a spiritual gift. So Paul says, all believers may prophesy, may exercise the spiritual gift of prophecy. Alas, today we don't see many of them doing it. But as far as God is concerned, there is no limit. You may all prophesy. But God never says you'll all be prophets. He gave some prophets as ministries. But the gift of prophesying is open to all. 
If we don't prophesy, it's not because God doesn't want it, it's because we haven't reached out to receive what God is offering us through the Holy Spirit. But I say this primarily to point out this very important distinction between the ministry gifts and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Let me just briefly enumerate the three points of distinction. With the ministry gift, the believer is the gift. With the spiritual gift, the believer receives the gift and is then able to minister to others. Secondly, with the ministry gift, every aspect of that man's ministry is part of the total gift. But with the spiritual gift, it's just a brief, momentary manifestation. That's all it is. Thirdly, in a ministry, character is involved. It must be, by the very nature of the thing. But with a spiritual gift, character is not involved. It does not in itself change your character. I think you just as well learn this now or you'll be headed for some bitter disappointments. A person may stand up and prophesy like an angel and keep you waiting for every appointment that he ever makes with you. See? It hasn't changed his character. Now it should, but it doesn't necessarily do so. Character is one thing, gifts are another. Put it another way, in another area, gifts are one thing, Fruit is another. The Holy Spirit has nine gifts, and if you look in Galatians 5.22, he has nine forms of fruit. What's the difference between fruit and gifts? Well, what's the difference between a Christmas tree and an apple tree? You can go to a Christmas tree, put a gift on it, take a gift off. It doesn't take a moment either way. But you can't go to an apple tree and put an apple on take an apple off. It comes by a process of growth and maturing and cultivation. And spiritual fruit comes that way. There's a process involved. But gifts come instantly. Now, this is not belittling gifts. Far from it. That's not my purpose. It's to point out the limitations and the differences between these various ways in which the Holy Spirit operates and which the grace of God operates. Some people say, well, brother, I've got fruit. I don't need gifts. You know what experience has taught me? to question just how much fruit people have that talk like that. Brother, I've got love, I don't need gifts. Well, one thing I'm sure is love will never lead a believer to refuse God's gifts. That's totally illogical. That kind of love is really just a whip to beat charismatic or Pentecostal people with. That's all it is. And God's love isn't used as a whip. But there is a valid distinction. Now you say, well, brother, friends, I've got all the love, you have the gifts. I say, brother, what are you going to do with all your love? Huh? How are you going to help humanity with that love you have? You need the gifts. The gifts are the means that make love effective. Imagine a mother sitting by her sick child. Honey, I love you, but I'm going to sit here, I'm not going to put my hand on your forehead, I'm not going to pray for you, I'm not even going to call the doctor, but I love you. How much love? Love in word, but not love in deed. In order to show love, you must have means that make love effective. What are the means? The gifts. Divorce the gifts from love. Paul says they're just like sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. But have love without gifts. What do you have? Frustration. Honey, I love you. I'd love to do something to help you, but there's nothing I can do. See, we mustn't be one-sided. We need love. We need gifts. We need gifts. We need fruit. We need spiritual gifts. We need ministries. None of these is a substitute for any of the others. How much do we need? We need all. And God never intended us to live a rationed life as Christians. This I'll come to at the close of this study. I'll return to this theme of the riches of God's grace. 